Hey everybody, welcome to your reptile video notes. So before we get into information about reptiles, we first need to reflect a little bit back on amphibians and how those compare to reptiles. So it really comes down to their egg. As you remember, amphibians rely on water for reproduction because that's what their eggs need to hatch babies, right? But 350 million years ago, this really important membrane called the amnion developed around an egg, which helps prevent dry out. And in reptiles, it's usually surrounded by a leathery shell. So when we talk about comparative anatomy, so, so far in terms of vertebrates, we've talked about fish, amphibians, and now we're into reptiles. So the neck bones are what are significantly different between these. Fish don't have a neck, so they can't turn their head. Fish have to turn their whole body when they're turning. Amphibians have a single cervical bone, so they can nod their head up and down, but they can't go side to side like reptiles. So reptiles have that vast range of neck movement. So when we talk about class reptilia, reptiles themselves are adapted to life on land. They have that amniotic egg, which allows them to move away from water. Their skin is watertight and it's made of keratin, which is a protein. They have a kidney that helps conserve water. They have a three chambered heart, claws, their respiratory system is improved. So they have lungs and they breathe that way versus through their skin, like a lot of amphibians. And they also lose that lateral line system. The external structure. So we talked about the skin doesn't have a respiratory function. They cannot breathe through their skin like an amphibian can, but their scales do provide protection and they also prevent water loss. And just like some other animals that we know, they do have to shed their skin. And this is called ecdysis. The skeleton is also significantly different in that they have some major differences with amphibians. So the skulls themselves are longer, so their actual head skull is longer. And they have this bony plate called a secondary palate that's kind of in the roof of their mouth, and it separates their nose from their mouth passages. Their limbs also extend laterally, so like out and down. So if you've ever watched like an animal crawl or even Zima, you'll see that their arms are kind of out as they move. And then it's important to note, too, that some primitive reptiles were bipedal, meaning they only walked on two legs. Some lizards also have the ability to drop their tails if caught by a predator. And this phrase is called autotomy. Gosh, that's a hard word. But you'll see this up here. So this lizard, for example, dropped its tail and then it regrows its tail. And Zima actually has this ability too. However, I made sure to kind of mess around with his tail from a very young age because I didn't want him to accidentally drop it if he felt threatened. So it's something they can do. However, they don't always do it if they feel like they can get away or they're not in danger. When it comes to nutrition and digestion, reptiles have a lot of different varying diets. So you have reptiles that are completely herbivores, you have ones that are omnivores, and then you have your carnivorous reptiles. So they have a lot of modifications for this. They have teeth, as you see in this alligator up here. They have venom, like some snakes and lizards do. And then they also can constrict their prey, like you see down here with the snake. Turtles don't have teeth, however, but they do have a keratinized beak. So their beak is very hard, and that's what helps them grab prey to swallow it. And then some lizards, like a chameleon, for example, have this sticky, movable tongue that kind of sticks out and grabs prey, kind of similar to how frogs would catch their prey. Reptile venom is also something that most people are super interested in, although it's scary if you ever come across a venomous snake, for example, in the wild, but some of them can be venomous. So snakes have hollow fangs. This is where the venom comes out, and you can see that right there in that picture. The Komodo dragon, though, is also a venomous lizard, but their venom is a little bit different. It is in their actual jaws, so it comes out once they bite. So it's in their jaw, and that's how it gets into the animal versus the venom of a snake. So when we talk about snakes, snakes can actually be two types of venomous. They can be rear fanged or front fanged. So the rear fang snakes deliver mild toxins that are really just meant to subdue small prey, not kill it, just kind of calm it down so they can eat it. Um, for example, the hognose snake, which is often kept as a pet because the actual biting process of delivering the venom is rather difficult, especially to a human, so most people feel comfortable owning these. Front fanged, though, are the ones that are responsible for most human snake bite issues, and these are things like rattlesnakes and cobras. 
So the venom also can have one or more of the following toxins in it. So a cytotoxin is actually meant to kind of like liquefy the insides before it swallows it. So it makes digestion a little bit easier. A neurotoxin is when you think of it, neuro, your nervous system. So it causes paralysis. It can also cause the stopping of like involuntary body functions. And then hemotoxins, think like hemoglobin relates to blood. So this is a blood poison and it actually disrupts blood clotting, which causes internal bleeding. So speaking of bleeding, let's talk about circulation. So reptiles have a three-chambered heart, so they have two atria and a ventricle, but this time they have a partial septum, which you can see right here in this picture. So this kind of helps to separate oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, not quite the way of having two ventricles like birds and mammals have, but close. So it's advantageous because reptiles can breathe intermittently. There's been many times where I look at Zima and I'm like, oh, is he, is he breathing? Especially at night when they're sleeping. So they don't breathe like constant breathing rate like we may be used to as humans. But it is disadvantageous in that that septum cannot totally separate the two types of blood. It's also important to note that crocodiles have a four-chambered heart. So crocodiles have more of a relation to birds. And you'll see that as we get into the bird unit as well, that birds also have a four-chambered heart. When we talk about respiration, so reptiles do something called body cavity breathing. So they like their ribs expand and come back together, expand, come back together, which you see in this picture here with this reptile. So it's a pretty dramatic looking process. That's because they don't have a diaphragm. So as humans, we have a diaphragm right below our lungs and that helps us with breathing and to pull air in. They don't have this ability, so they have to expand and contract their body cavity. The lungs also have more folds than amphibians, which creates a larger surface for gas exchange. So we see reptile here, amphibian there, and you notice the significant difference in the size and shape of the lungs. Temperature regulation is also something that reptiles have to deal with, just like amphibians. So, however, though, being on a terrestrial environment most of the time causes exposure to more temperature extremes. Usually amphibians are around water, and usually water has to be is around a certain temperature unless it's frozen. Well, when you're on land, you're dealing with more of these extremes. So they bask when they're cold to warm up, and then when they're hot, they go into shade. However, if the temperature drops too low, something called torpor can happen. And this is where the activity reduces in hibernation. This is also something you see with all those iguanas that we talk about in Florida that fall out of trees and they're not dead, they're still alive, but they're in a state of torpor because it's too cold for their body systems to function. So they just, their bodies just kind of reduce activity and shut down for a while. Some species also hibernate together, and this is really common in snakes, um, especially in, in this area, kind of in the mountains, you'll see rattlesnakes that hibernate together. And in the spring, you have to be very cautious if you're hiking and things like that, so you don't come across them. But this is called a hibernaculum, and you see that over here in this picture of garter snakes. So when we talk about nervous and sensory functions, reptiles are definitely more advanced in this department than amphibians are. So most of them do have binocular vision, so that can help with depth perception. They have that tympanic membrane that allows them to hear. But snakes are a little different because they actually can't hear, so they don't have this. They actually detect vibrations through their jaw. So that's how they feel whether there's movement going on or not. Um, reptiles also have something called a parietal eye, and you'll see that in this picture down here, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen this on Zima. So it's on the top of their head, and they can detect light as it moves kind of over, especially like birds of prey and things like that that might hunt them. Um, funny story, when Zima was little, he, I, I was in college, and he used to drive back and forth with me to my parents' house, and I would let him sit on like my council and my um, Jeep, and I had a sunroof. And so every time we would go under like an overpass, he would like duck and flatten himself because he thought it was something, you know, predator or something that's going to come eat him. So they can detect light. They just can't see like clear objects. Um, the tongue flicking, same thing. They always stick their tongues out. That's how they smell. So you've seen Zima do this. You see snakes do this like in this picture here. 
they bring that scent into their mouth and it goes over the Jacobson's organ and that's how they process what the smell is. And then something else special to just pit vipers and rattlesnakes is they have something called pit organs, which help them see objects that have a different temperature than the environment, such as a prey animal. Um, reptiles do have kidneys that help them conserve water, so they work under a higher blood pressure. Their waste is in the form of uric acid, so it's kind of like a thick paste. There is liquid that comes out as well, but it's all together, all at one opening known as the cloaca. And most reptiles that live in marine environments have salt glands, so this is how they excrete excess salt, which you see in that picture. In terms of reproduction, mating is usually quite the elaborate courtship behavior, which you see in these two uh, images below of males trying to impress the females. The offspring then develop in that amniotic egg we talked about that's so important to being successful on land, and they do have internal fertilization. In terms of development, the females usually make very elaborate nests. The species are going to bury their eggs and hide their nests. Only about 100 species actually like stay around to protect and guard their young, but most of the time they just hide the nest and abandon it. The temperature of the nest, though, does influence what sex the offspring are. So if you'll notice these different temperatures over here for females, males, and then to get both males and females. So when we talk about diversity, there's four orders we're going to talk about. First is order testidines. These are turtles and tortoises, and we know them for their shells. And there's two parts. So the carapace is the top. Oopsies. Carapace is the top. And then the plastron is the bottom. Order crocodilia is crocodiles, but also alligators, caimans, and gavials. And these have been unchanged for millions of years, and they are anatomically closer, like we mentioned, to birds and dinosaurs than any other reptiles. They also have several important adaptations to help them become so successful over so, such a long period of time, such as their snout. They have an epiglottis to block water from getting down their throats when they eat. They swallow rocks to help break up prey, and they have that really strong tail. Order Sphenodontida is only really one species left, and that's the Tuatara. So this species only lives in New Zealand. However, they are still in a lot of danger due to rats that eat the babies and also compete for food with the adults. Order Squamata is your lizards and your snakes, and then something called worm lizards, which kind of look like worms and snakes crossed together. And there's three suborders within these. So Sauria, Serpentes, and Amphisbaena, and those are lizards, snakes, and worm lizards. So a little bit more about snakes because everyone's always interested in these, right? So snakes are believed to have evolved from burrowing lizards. So this is proven by they don't have limbs anymore and they have lost their protective eye scale. But also important to note that some snakes, like boas and pythons, still have a vestigial pelvic girdle. So they still have remnants of the pelvis, which is where hind limbs would have attached. It's also important to know that snakes cannot eat an adult human, despite what you see on TV. Our shoulders are too broad as, as adult humans for them to swallow. They have tried. There's a documented case of one attempting to in 1995, but they cannot actually swallow us. And then... Lastly, uh, just some environmental alerts for you to be aware of in terms of invasive species. So Burmese pythons and green iguanas are both huge problems in Florida, right? And I'm sure you've all heard about this to some extent. Um, most of them were released due to the exotic pet trade. So people get these animals and they get very, very large. And then they're like, oh, never mind. I can't take care of this. I don't have a spot for this or it's going to eat my dog or my baby or whatever. So they're like, oh, Florida's nice. I'll just let them go. Well, then they've been successful in Florida. They have long lifespans. There's lots of food. They don't really have natural predators. So it's really important to be aware of these situations, but also to remember as well, whenever you get a pet, you need to research what goes into it because we're also having an issue now in Georgia with people releasing tegu lizards. So Releasing a pet to the wild is never the answer, but it's especially become a problem in Florida with both the Burmese pythons and the green iguanas, which you see all the time on the news, right? All right, well, that is it for your notes on reptiles.